So can we expect that in the future, the drugs that we've been talking about, the incretins, are going to be part of standard diabetes treatment? Yes, absolutely. I mean, they're already they're already well established into our pathways. Nice as approved, many GL, many GLP ones up to this point. Zepatide has just got its final approval through Nice now. Um, so we're moving to that being released probably in the next few weeks to months here. So we're excited about that. So I think absolutely, it's got its place in therapy. We need drugs like this. The main um attraction i suppose so far with the glp ones that are already on the market is they've got good outcome data so there's data around not just the weight loss and the hba1c lowering but specifically around protection for cardiovascular events um and so the we know people with type 2 diabetes well people with diabetes in general but in this case we're talking about type 2 diabetes People with type 2 diabetes have a very high cardiovascular risk. Um, Some of them have already had cardiovascular events um, and we need to protect them from having further events or from having their first event in the first place. And these drugs are very efficacious for doing that. So they've got good outcome data to show that you're less likely to go on and have a further event um, and that you're less likely if you have an event to die from that event, you're less likely to be hospitalized, etc. Um, and then the other the other part of things is around um, stroke prevention as well. So the GLP ones actually have good stroke data. Um, which is slightly deviates from some of the SGLT2 um, work that's been done. Obviously, SGLT2s have good data also around cardiovascular events, particularly heart failure, um, but they don't have the stroke data. So the GLP ones kind of come into their own around around stroke, So, which is interesting. So um, the tizepatide and the retriotide, um, we're waiting on some of the outcome data for that still, but obviously we can... Um, you know, you don't want to leap to conclusions, but I, I'll eat my hat if, if, if they've not got a good outcome data, to be honest. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, all the agents that we've talked about so far are peptides and they have to be injected. But recently I've read about Orphogliprone, which is an oral non-peptide GLP-1 agonist. What impact could this have? Yeah, I mean, people do. We've already seen it. So we've got we've got an oral GLP one on the market, albeit that we can't get hold of these GLP ones at the moment. But um, uh, ribelsis. So that was that was it. Was really nice to have an oral option. There are people who are needle phobic, or they really are very resistant to starting an injectable therapy. Um, so with the oral agent, it gives you this option where you can give something. Um, the problem with the ribelsis is that it is a peptide what the what what the company has done Nova Nordist is that they've wrapped the peptide in something called a snack protein um it's really cl- i mean to be honest i do find these things absolutely fascinating but they basically wrap this little um this little coating i suppose if you like this protein around it so the protein gets degraded and the and the peptide stays alive and manages to get to where it goes so it's that's how they've manufactured theirs um, but because of that, you have some significant sort of administration instructions <clears throat> that if they don't follow the administration instructions, the person living with diabetes doesn't follow those administration instructions, you've then got problems with that being absorbed in the way that we would want it to and it actually being efficacious. So um, you have to take it well away from any other food medicine. Um, you can only take a sip of water, not too much water, otherwise it passes too quickly and the snack protein st- is intact and doesn't release the, the peptide so so you do have to follow these admin, admin instructions and it does make me wonder whether people are really going to be that adherent with um with those instructions and whether we will get this kind of bouncing around of the blood glucose because because people sometimes do and sometimes don't follow or they maybe follow some of it and not all of it so it does make me wonder what happens so this this the new one um just means that it's not a peptide it's not got you know you don't have to go to these great lengths um it's it it does stimulate the glp1 receptor um but it's not a glp1 um so it's not a peptide and um, so it's very clever um and i think that yeah we've got a whole cohort of people who really would rather not be on an injectable therapy for them that's got significant concerns some of them have relatives who have been on insulin had very traumatic experiences around 
insulin admin um particularly if it's been a parent or a grandparent where they've been on like eight millimeter like massive needles with their insulin and they've been really traumatized by seeing insulin in historically so um so you can give by buy some time for them i suppose um in the sense that this will give us something which is efficacious without needing to go onto insulin or um, needing to go onto injectable GLP-1. It's almost like another step for me. Mm -hmm. And what would you like frontline practitioners, I mean, pharmacists, nurses, doctors, and, and so forth, what would you like them to be telling patients about these drugs? I think it's really highlighting the sort of breadth of the um, benefits to people. You know, we know that there's lots of clinical inertia in practice. There's lots of giving people um, lots of time um, riding with quite high HbA1c's often and and weight gain. And I think it's I think I would like people to to really consider. Um, not giving people years between you know if somebody's got a really high hba1c you know you um that we shouldn't be leaving that for a year to then revisit with something i appreciate that it's all about the holistic management of somebody um and we do need to put in lifestyle and dietary advice but there are circumstances where if somebody's very high to a high or very high cardiovascular risk um, with a high HbA1c, we do need to action something relatively quickly. Time is heart, it's kidney, it's it's eyes, it's 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 all of these things. And you know, when you're not doing something, damage is happening. And and um, and I think that's something that I would really like practitioners to think more about um, and to try and highlight that really to people it's all about person choice some people still won't want to perceive something they want that time to to intervene with diet and lifestyle some people do well we've got the remission program now at our disposal which is if you're within five years of diagnosis we can refer people to remission so there are there are some more efficacious and um, more intensive lifestyle options as well that would be certainly something that i would pursue for my younger pe people living with type 2 most certainly and in, in that very short window of from diagnosis but i think for for many they'll lie outside of that and we still need to be doing something and highlighting certainly the cardiovascular benefits and the protection to your kidneys if you've certainly if they've got albumin albuminuria by then you know we time time is kidney at that point if you've got the albuminuria you need to be doing as much as you possibly can to protect those kidneys relatively quickly so